Up next, a 100-year-old African-American church and the community it serves. Welcome to another edition of Paths to the Present. I'm your host, Gail Street. Welcome to Scotland AME Zion Church in Potomac. It's located on Seven Locks Road between Democracy Boulevard and Tuckerman Lane. I think you'll agree this is a very picturesque spot that evokes a lot of history. In September of 2005, this church turned 100 years old. The congregation celebrated with a week-long series of services and special events. When Scotland Church first began, the land around here was home to descendants of freed slaves. On today's show, we'll learn about that early community, the church they built, and the impact that it's had on the neighborhood of the same name. But first, I have a history mystery for you. Do you know what this is? Used on the farm, this tool's wooden handle is attached to a metal hook with a sharp point. Think you know what it is? Stay tuned, I'll give you the answer at the end of the show. Today the Scotland AME Zion Church is thriving. At 100 years old with close to 120 members, this church provides programs for children, teens, adults, and seniors. And of course, it offers ample opportunity for worship. Today, congregants of the Scotland AME Zion Church come from different backgrounds and nationalities. But closer inspection reveals that many who worship here today descend from the early families who settled this land more than 100 years ago. My great-grandfather was William Dove, and he the first settler that was here. And uh, out of the he had 15 kids, and um, I think what he did, he just, the, ho the uh, home place was not too far from here, right up the hill where this development is right here now, and uh, that's the home place. Betty Thompson lives just up the road from Scotland Church. Her home today is a town home that was built as an urban renewal project in the 60s. Today, her section of homes is nicknamed Doveland. That's because so many Dove descendants still live here. Odelia Dove Cooper is Betty's sister-in-law and neighbor. She joined Scotland Church when she was 14. Back in those days, you know, Sunday was church all day. And then there was the you know, the dinners, the just church, visiting churches coming in the afternoon, and it was a uh, family, you know, church family was there on Sunday. When this congregation first began in 1905, it was a family affair, and they met in a private home. Back then it was known as the Warner Church. Around 1920, Sarah Matilda Sewell Sims and her husband Otho donated the land where the church now stands. To build a structure, the group worked hard to raise the funds. I have a book that I think it's, uh, it's a few pages about how they, the old people that used to raise the money for the building, they would have dinners and they would uh, donate one chicken, one cake, and uh, a, bunch of, a, a bunch of bananas. And they had, uh, the dinner would cost, I think they would raise about, wasn't even $20. 
The original church was fully completed in 1926. It was much smaller than the one they use today. Look closely. It's still possible to see the details. And it still has the original tin roof. And through this door is the original altar. Today, this is the church office. Reverend James Pfeiffer, Scotland's pastor since 1999, remarks on the size of the original church. It, it, would, it would surprise most of us today if we could really see what it really looked like. But uh, here we are, and it's still back there, and of course it's been designated historical, so it has to stay back there. And that's a good thing because we can always look back at, at and see, you know, as the, some of these spirituals say, look where he brought us from. As the congregation grew, so did the need for more space. In 1963, Scotland Church was expanded to its present size. Virginia Baker, also a Dove descendant, recalls the process. I was working with my grandmother at that time with the building of the new church, which you know, we had to go to Bethesda Bank to get the money to build, and you know, the money for it, and they gave it to us to build, and uh, we built the church, got the deed and everything straightened, and so we built the church, built this uh, edifice here. Bernice Dove married into the family. She was a young adult when the new sanctuary was used for the very first time. Oh, it was just like heaven that <laughs> came down on earth. We came in it a lot. We had a, it was just a big fellowship, and we were just overwhelmed and just so happy and glad to be in our new church that we had um, a celebration, a big celebration. And the bishop came and, and, and uh, some other pastors and, and the presiding elder. It was just one big to walk through his church, yeah. And today at age 100, Scotland AME Zion Church is poised to expand yet again. They hope to add a 300-seat sanctuary just in front of the old building. When we return, we'll look at Scotland Church's impact on the neighborhood of the same name. Stay with us. Welcome back to Paths to the Present. I'm your host, Gail Street. The Scotland AME Zion Church grew from its community's need for a convenient place of worship. African Americans had settled all along Seven Locks Road from what we know today as Democracy Boulevard to well past what is now the Cabin John Shopping Center. Back then, the homes were spread out, the roads were dirt, and opportunities were limited. But throughout the years, this was a community with a vibrant church at its core. Virginia Baker grew up in Scotland. Like many of the kids, she sang in the church choir and played baseball for the Scotland Marylanders. Scotland is a close-knit uh, family group anyway, regardless of, you know, the last names or whoever. We were just close-knit. Everybody to us was just like they were our brothers and sisters. Like in church, you say brothers and sisters in Christ. In the community, it was the same way. We were together doing everything in the community. This was the only thing we had to do was one little black church, one little black school. So that's how we all connected, and we were all together. During these segregated times, black communities like this one had little choice but to band together. Since opportunities were limited, many were economically disadvantaged. 
the houses that we lived in need a lot of repairs, and it really wasn't that in that great a shape. And we didn't have running water. We had outside johns, and we we had a pump that we got our water from in the, in the middle of the community. Or even we walked down the bottom of this hill, not too far from the church was a spring, and that's where we got our water from those two sources. As the years went by, predominantly white, middle-class suburban neighborhoods began to surround Scotland. The community was threatened. People were coming in, buying up the land, and a lot of the older the people were selling their land and moving to Washington where they took the money they could get better homes. And we, we didn't want to move. Um, say SOS, Save Our Scotland, and we all formed together. And the main uh, meeting place was right here in this church. And at that time, the bottom part of here was, you know, the basin part was fixed, and we had a lot of meetings. We came together for the meetings. The initial support for SOS came from a very unexpected source. In 1965, Joyce Siegel lived only about a mile away. Now that county schools were desegregated, her children went to school with kids from Scotland. Upon seeing the living conditions, she urged the community at large to get involved. Working alongside longtime Scotland resident, Miss Geneva Mason, and with the significant help from Scotland's pastor, Reverend Randall, the community was rebuilt. It took six years, but eventually water was brought to the 100 brand new townhomes. It was wonderful because back in them days, we didn't have room with bedrooms, with doors. So we got the bedroom, we could close the door, we could uh, take baths and wouldn't have to worry about getting the water. And um, carrying the water, just turn the faucet on. And washing dishes, that's the thing too, the dishwashing and Stuff like that, we appreciate it. They're our homes. We didn't care. They said, well, you don't have this, you don't have a dishwasher. We didn't care. Long as we had running water. That was the main thing. Improving the housing wasn't the only effort of this group. Daycare was established and tutoring programs developed in order to support the social needs of the community all of which was supported by the church. That connection still exists today. I just think they connect together, the community and the church bond together. And, and some of the younger people look to us now that we're the oldest. We're the, old, we're the elder people in the church. And some of their parents had gone on and this is still their security because they know us and they can always come to us when they have problems. So, have you figured out this month's history mystery? It's a hay bale hook. Farmers would hold it by the handle and use the hook tip to pick up hay bales. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. If you have comments for us or ideas for future shows, send an email to paths-present at comcast.net. Be sure to tune in again next time as Paths to the Present begins a year-long series traveling along Route 355. See you then.